Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian here at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C. at the conclusion of a great uh, event on cybersecurity. And we have with us George Perkovich, who is the Vice President for Studies here. Uh, sir, thanks very much for taking uh, time to speak with us. Talk to us a little bit about you know two fascinating panel discussions, very different, covering the entire gamut of cybersecurity issues. What were some of the key takeaways from both of these panels you wanted the audience to go home with? Well, in the first panel, uh, what all the speakers said was it's it's very important for people to make distinctions, that it, it's a scary world out there. There's a lot happening in cyber from the information warfare uh, in the election campaign to credit card theft, uh, hacks on banks, all of these things that people are afraid of. And, and kind of each, in a sense, is in a different category, both in terms of who's doing it, what the action is, and what the appropriate ways to either defend against the action or uh, try to deter somebody from taking that action are. So, so those distinctions are very, very important, number one. Uh, and also in both panels, actually, there was important discussion about you know, what the role of government is uh, as distinct from the private sector, meaning companies, very big companies that uh, manage a lot of the information, but also individual citizens. So, so that most of the vulnerabilities come through our own basic behavior and whether we're securing and taking all the steps we need to, to secure our, our information and our systems. I think those, those came through all of the panels. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, Jared Cohen of Jigsaw, who is your uh, partner on this uh, on, the, on, the, on today's event, uh, made a fascinating point that you know if I came into the audience and I spattered white powder on everybody and told them that there's a five percent chance that it was a deadly virus, folks would attack them. And yet, those are the sort of risks that every day people are willing to put up with in in their in their cyber lives. There was a little bit of a discussion also in terms of the balance between cyber offense, cyber defense. What are some of the clear issues that this new administration is going to tackle? And I'll use that as sort of a precursor to get some of your thoughts on how the new administration should think about this brave new world, as you guys put it. Well, I mean, I, I think on the one hand, you know, people would, would say that right now it's an environment where the offense has an advantage. There are a lot of bad guys out there from around the world. They can get access in a lot of different ways. They have a lot of different motives. Uh, and, and while defenses can be much stronger, starting with basic hygiene and security practices, there is a recognition that it, at some level, you know, very sophisticated attackers will get through. So then the question is, what do you do to motivate those people to stop or to punish them? And that's something that every administration, you know, whether it's Clinton, Bush, uh, Obama, has had to wrestle with. And now the Trump administration will wrestle with it too. And my sense is uh, we had very intelligent people in the past administrations, Republican and Democrat alike, and they wrestle with these things and they kind of come up with a way of doing it. And so it's unlikely that intelligent people in the Trump administration, if they honestly look at these issues, are going to say, no, no, that was all wrong. There's a totally radically new way to do this that's going to work. Uh, the most likely thing would be relative uh, continuity because there are no easy solutions. It's a very fragile global system so that if you tried to aggressively you know, change the dynamic, you don't know who you're going to hurt and how much is going to blow back uh, against you. And so all of this is going to, I would suggest, lead to kind of more incremental um, efforts to do what others have been trying to do. One of the interesting features that uh, former Deputy uh, Homeland Security Secretary Jane Hall Lute mentioned was the erosion of, of trust in government institutions and how that's likely to impede this task, that populations throughout history have looked at their governments for, take care of my national security, take care of my policing, that that's an inherently public role. And yet she said that the, the confidence in government is so low that that is likely to very much complicate, if not impede, the government's role. You know, what is the government, you know, and this is an administration that is looking increasingly at private sector solutions to this. What is the inherent governmental role in this brave new world to, to try to, you know, there was some mention of the state of California has put some clear laws in that you can't do business in the state of California with the state of California unless you have some certain security protocols in. That's increasingly the case in Europe. You know, what is the government's role, inherent government role, in cyberspace. I think this is all in flux and it's in flux in different places. So in the US where we obviously have, you know, a long standing kind of skepticism of government, a, a feeling that private actors should be responsible, the private sector, you know, does things better. Um, there will be an evolution probably towards kind of more responsibility devolving to 
private actors. In France, it's totally the opposite. The state has always been, you know, kind of the leading provider of, of whatever, especially in terms of security. Uh, and other countries in between. So th I think it's all in flux. They're all wrestling with it. Um, what's unusual here is that the instruments, so, so, you know, if you think about traffic, I mean, governments build roads. Governments have the police, they have the bodies that make sure when the road gets uh, eroded, it's, it, it's fixed. On, uh, in information and cyber, almost all of that stuff is owned by private actors. Uh, so so the, the balance of kind of power and capability is very different in the cyber. And also there's so many actors and it's spread over such a geography that no one government's gonna be able to do it. And, and companies, and Jane Hall Luke talked about this, I mean, Google, Facebook, those companies have more data on you and me than the government does. Uh, companies are the big repositories of personal data. So now if you're worried about protecting your data, traditionally you would worry about the government would get access to your data, but we kind of freely give it to companies, but it all has to be protected. So the role of the private sector there is going to be enormously important. But, but we're just beginning to kind of um, figure out how to manage that. How does this new legislation that allows companies to market and traffic in a lot of these browsing histories, what does that mean in terms of the discussion going forward? Because there were obviously some of the large providers have said, we're, we're not going to do that because they already sense a backlash. What's the evolution of that debate and discussion? Well, I mean, first of all, right, the, the smarter companies realize there's going to be a backlash because of how much information they hold and their capacity to sell it. And a backlash not only in the U.S., but in much of the rest of the world, there's a very different attitude, which is much stronger about privacy. And so, and these are global companies. So they don't want to alienate a huge part of their uh, hopefully expanding market. So even though the law that was just passed, I would argue regretfully uh, from the standpoint of privacy, may allow companies to do that, they have to be thinking about uh, much larger equities there. One of the questions, and, and it was in the second panel, uh, that was discussed of sort of the industry role in both um, offensive cyber and as well as in defensive cyber. And, you know, as, as you've said, the relationships uh, and the entire business is evolving as we speak. You know, and there was a lot of talk about letters of mark. Mm -hmm. And if you were a, a naval warfare uh, fan, you understand that, that's, that the government would allow privateers, give them a letter of mark to act as an agent of the state so that they weren't engaging in piracy on the high seas. And something that if you went back to the early 1800s, you know, American newspapers and the American public followed privateers and how they used to do in these, in these sorts of conflicts. Talk to us a little bit about that role. Um, other nations are doing it, China's doing it, Russia's doing it in terms of giving sort of civilians the, the ability to participate in a cyber core. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about the balance, the role of industry in both offensive, defensive, and industry's sort of broader role in this ecosystem. Well, again, it, you know, cyberspace is global. So there are a number of countries that have, in effect, uh, done the equivalent of letters of mark. In other words, we call them proxies. So, so they have actors who may or may not be official employees of the government, but are whether they're militias or other groups uh, who go out and hack the U.S., uh, steal data, do other things. And, and that state kind of denies that they're state actors, but may uh, uh, allow them to operate, may pay them on the side. So similar thing to, to pirates and letters of mark. What's talked about in the U.S. Is, is more kind of the analog on the defensive side of that. So there are all these different kind of attacks coming in. And, and technically, legally, the U.S. government says uh, the government will do the defense. Private actors may not go outside of their own uh, networks. But there's an understanding that that's not going to be sufficient. The government isn't going to defend everything. And so a lot of companies, especially the ones with great capability, are saying, well, we have the capability to know who's about to attack us, where the attack's coming, and we can monitor them, and then we can tr act to try to stop them from attacking. And then other forms are, are, are more aggressive. In other words, you like actually hack back and steal the data back or do other things to harm them. Uh, and I don't think anybody in our panel would advocate that because it, it could be destabilizing. But, but the issue that's a legitimate question is the role of private actors to stop uh, attacks by defending themselves, including outside of network. And that's going to be an issue where, where uh, there's going to have to be an evolution in, in the U.S. because the current law 
just isn't realistic to what's being done. There are lots of security companies being set up offshore now uh, who don't operate under that law, uh, but who can do more uh, aggressive kinds of defense uh, for hire. And, and so this is going to have to be dealt with internationally. And what we at Carnegie are suggesting are principles of conduct that if you followed those principles, uh, you would act in a responsible kind of good housekeeping uh, way of doing defense. And if you didn't follow those principles, uh, our argument would be that the insurance companies and others shouldn't cover you. And so try to use the discipline of the market to, to mobilize people to do defense in a sound way. The president is passionate about Buy America, Build America. He's passed a whole uh, 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 raft of measures, more expected to come, uh, certainly on H-1B visas, uh, you know, a controversial issue where um, some Americans do lose their jobs when these overseas talent does come into the United States. There are some who argue that this talent is superior, mm -hmm. and so that's the reason why we're bringing them into the United States and giving them some of these jobs. Uh, Chris Painter, you know, mentioned that China, too, has built is, is doing some similar things uh, to make sure that all that intellectual property resides and stays in China. You know, what are the pitfalls of a Buy America, Build America philosophy in a cyber world that is truly, as you've mentioned repeatedly, fully globalized? Well, there are a number. I mean, from the company point of view, uh, there are more people living in the rest of the world than there are living in the U.S. So you, as, as companies, you would want to be able to sell in lots of other places. And yet, if the U.S. is seen as very protectious, making it harder for others to do business here, uh, the logic would be that others will then make it similarly uh, difficult for the U.S. And, and again, just comparing populations and growth of markets for U.S. companies, that may not be good, which then isn't good for U.S. labor and, and so on and so forth. So the argument, which I think is plausible, is you know, kind of a more open system is going to be of greater benefit ultimately to the U.S. That's certainly the view of U.S. companies. It's been the view of past governments. Uh, and we'll see where, where the administration uh, comes out on this. There's a separate issue, uh, though they get related, which is from a security point of view. So, so part of China's argument is a security argument, saying uh, because of the Snowden revelations and other things that the U.S. has put trap doors, uh, other uh, uh, um, vehicles in software and hardware that allow the U.S. government to spy uh, on them. And so they're not going to buy products that weren't produced, for example, in China where the government feels they can control and kind of keep out the U.S. espionage being built into software and hardware. Now that there can be a legitimate argument to do that, and then it can also be the, um, the, the propaganda argument for protectionist thing of just building your own industry. And so uh, that pressure may mount uh, here as well. But it would have very bad effects, wouldn't it, if the United States doesn't have access to the very best talent and the very best technology? Oh, on the labor side, right. I, I, in terms of getting um, labor to come work in your companies, I mean, I think uh, any of of the companies would say that we've benefited disproportionately from being open and taking researchers and young technologists uh, from you know China, India, especially largely Asia, uh, basically, uh, and having them here. And and when you go to those countries, which I do, I mean, in those countries, they say we're losing from the brain drain that goes to the U.S. They're getting uh, our best and our brightest, and they're working for the U.S. Now the U.S. is going to um, shut that off. Uh, it, it will be to a great advantage um, to others who would open themselves up then to this great talent coming from Asia. And last question. This is the uh, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, there has time and again been discussion of a, a global treaty. Mm -hmm. uh, there to be uh, some form of disarmament to this, mm -hmm. standardized rules of the road. Um, what do you think the prospects of that are? Because Chris Painter, who is the man at the State Department who's now has this seat, you know, he said, look, one of the challenges is what we look at as, as information security, uh, you know, or a privacy concern is, is an information issue uh, for a lot of these other countries and try to manipulate it in, in, in that fashion uh, and try to designate non-cyber things really, you know, to, to, to turn information things into cyber things and vice versa. What do you think the prospects are for some form of global convention on not only rules of the road, 
but deterrence, you know, all of these issues that we've spent years talking about. I mean, this is exactly what we work on here at Carnegie in our cyber work and, and trying to identify what are, the, what are the greatest threats of kind of offensive action in cyberspace that you could try to get restraint on. Because uh, there's a lot of things out there, but you want to, you know, try to prioritize if you're going to actually have meaningful uh, limitations. Our view is uh, th there isn't going to be a, a treaty. There won't be a mechanism as formal uh, as a treaty um, because, A, cyber is very hard to verify, unlike counting nuclear missiles and destroying missiles, which you can see uh, by satellites. Um, but also, the U.S. doesn't ratify treaties anymore, so our uh, our Congressional system's kind of broken down, so it's impossible to imagine getting 67 votes, which would be required in the Senate for any kind of uh, a, a treaty. So what we're focusing on instead, I think w what a lot of the world would agree on, are, are, are norms. So there are promises that we might, governments might make to each other, which would say, um, I won't corrupt the integrity of your data in your biggest banks if you don't corrupt the integrity of data in my banks. Now, it's not a treaty, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm making a commitment. So if you detect me in your bank, I've lost a lot more credibility and faith, and you've now uh, kind of been given an opening for punishing me. I promised I wouldn't do it. So there's, even though it's not as hard as a treaty, our view is these kind of commitments uh, are feasible and would gradually civilize the domain. And that's what you want to do. That's, history evolves through kind of gradual efforts to develop rules. They're not rules at first. They're basically understandings uh, that may develop because you know I'll punch you if you do that. And over time, we say, well, we might as well write it down because we've kind of learned this behavior and we want the new generation to learn the behavior. And that's where we're at with cyber. We're at the early stage where it's not going to be laws and treaties, but, but kind of agreements amongst uh, the civilized players. And generally, people don't like to get punched. Right, and and that's the, really in cyber that will ultimately be the be the argument is is things are so interconnected that everybody's going to have a stake in everybody else doing relatively well because if you suffer, your network suffer, it's likely going to blow back into mine. George Perkovich, Vice President for Studies here at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, sir, thanks very much for joining us. My pleasure, thanks.